Welcome to the Star of Brian. All right, everybody, let's try this again. Ben Parr. Now you can come up. Shake of Brothership. Welcome to the Startup Grind Hot Seat. I mean, this seat, I don't know if you knew this, but it's a it's it's one of the most famous chairs in Silicon Valley. Did you know that? I did not know that. We've had guys like uh, Tony Conrad. We had Tony last month. We had MG Siegler. MG is a nice guy. Nice guy. Had some nice things to say about you. Um, and we've had... Uh, I, heard there, I heard they said something or something. I was disgusted for some reason. Oh, at the event? Yeah. Well, you don't you don't subscribe to it? you don't watch it every month. Uh, uh, well, you just say you do. I yeah. I I know I, I you missed that piece. Yeah. I abs absolutely, but I just missed it. I think he said some good things about you. Did he not say something good about you? Oh no, I have a great relationship with him. Yeah, he likes you. He really likes you. Like in, I mean, like I was surprised how much he likes you. <laughs> Not in a weird way or anything. Um, I'll let him know. Let me uh, let me introduce Ben Parr. Um, ben. Uh, Ben is a product of the Midwest, the born and raised in a small town in Illinois, attended uh, Northwestern, uh, graduated in political science um, and human nature. S science and human culture, political science and business. I screwed that up. Um, uh, ben has lived uh, all over the world. He's lived in Croatia. He's lived in Thailand. Uh, he has... Uh, uh, he, ben is... Ben is... What's, what I find very unique about Ben is Ben is actually an entrepreneur. Uh, first and, and has been involved in a number of different entrepreneurial ventures and he also happens to be a tech writer for uh, possibly the largest tech blog as per page views on the web. No? Uh, you dispute that? Largest independent technology um, news website focused on digital. <laughs> we, we, the truth, I screwed the, that well, up too. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it this way. We're more than just technology now. That's true. I actually want to talk about that. Be, that, that's the, we're going to get there. So, so tell us about. Um, so you graduate from Northwestern. Um, did you plan to be an entrepreneur? Did you plan to be something else? Like what? What were you going to do when? What were? What were? What was your grand scheme when you graduated from college? What were you going to do? I was going to be an astronaut, but NASA said no. Hell no. <laughs> they shut it down. So. Oh yeah, they shut me down. I, I <laughs> cried for weeks. Uh, so let's see. Recapping my life. I was born in Princeton, Illinois, and why am I doing that? Uh, Northwestern. So I went to Northwestern, <laughs> and I originally went in uh, as an astronomy major, actually. I was going to uh, go into research, into space and science, and focus on, uh, focus on getting, like, actually wrote in my essay that my goal was to build a commercial space station. Um, that is still my final life goal. That I have four of them, and that is my final one. Um, Do you but want to share any of the other ones? I'm, I'm sure I'll share them throughout this entire okay. conversation. Right, Bu building, a great com building a great company is also one of them. Okay, that's a good one. Um, but uh, I realized quickly that I didn't want to be on the research end of science. I wanted to be on the, uh, on the management and business end of science. So um, that's where the entrepreneurship, I guess, comes in. And I built Northwestern's entrepreneurship curriculum. I became a president of Northwestern's entrepreneurship group. Um, I created one of its first entrepreneurship competitions called um, Entrepreneur Idol, actually. And we had like audience voting, you know, the whole bit. And now it's like a 10, like they, they grew it. It was just one school and it was a two school thing. And now it's like a 10, 15 school operation with like, um, Tens of like they're giving away tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's nice to oh, see cool. people taking the mantle and going. Um, but I'm an entrepreneur first and foremost. I did entrepreneurship curriculum, uh, and that's the direction I w I was going. Uh, the journalism thing is kind of a fluke, really. Yeah. So t talk to us, talk to us about that. How did you? Uh, well, let's let's talk about you being an entrepreneur first. So you've done a number of different ventures. You worked on some Facebook apps. You worked on some startups. What, you know, what what did you learn? Like, tell us something you learned. What, what was, what, tell us about a dark day in Ben Parr's uh, entrepreneurial life. Tell us, do you remember a dark day? Have you had dark days? As I, being I, I feel like I need, like, like low, sad music and, like, storm. Yeah. Like, I need rain. We can probably do that. Do we have that? <laughs> that one works, that too, I sad. guess. That was way sad. Uh, so, all right, a uh, dark <clears throat> time story. So, 
when I first left Northwestern in 2008, I first thing I did was I worked on a, with a Facebook application company. I joined two of my entrepreneurial mentors um, in building a Facebook application company. This was during, I guess, what you called the boom when um, Facebook apps were doing very, very well. And we were building this app called Friend Quilts, which um, took your um, which took YouTube videos, Flickr photos, all those different thing, types of um, media, and you could turn them into these beautiful mosaics, and you could like create a mosaic for an event, like maybe a sports game, or maybe a uh, tribute to an athlete, or maybe just to commemorate a birthday party. And it was like beautiful, and it was easily shared, all that kind of thing. Um, and we got some initial traction, but not all that much. Um, and what we learned, and this is the lesson I learned um, product-wise, is that your users have to get the value out of the product almost instantly. If they do not get the value out of the product within seconds, they're going to jump ship and go to something else where they're going to get the value. And that was one of the hard lessons. There were a couple other hard lessons, um, but that's probably the biggest takeaway I took from that because eventually Facebook changed how apps went viral and our, start our startup failed as did many other Facebook application startups and I moved on. And so, so you worked on the Facebook application, and then, uh, and then what? And then, t tell us about tell us about the story of, of getting to Mashable. So you joined Mashable in two thousand eight, that right? So, um, I joined as a part time writer in two thousand eight. I had a full time job at a web health company called Spine Health dot com, okay. and it was again I joined one of my entrepreneurial mentors at that company. To, we're going to try to build it into I guess the next WebMD. Um, and it went fine for a while, but eventually my mentor left, and I'm not really all that into health, and I don't have any back pain, so I didn't really care too much. I can tell you everything about sciatica or herniated discs, though. I still remember Talk everything. Talk about a sad music sound that we need now. That's when we need it. Talk about sciatica. Um, but I mean, I mean, I mean, the site, the site did a lot for a lot of people. I have like some a really, really debilitating set of diseases. Uh, but I didn't have that passion for it. Um, so I decided long before that I was going to move and it didn't have any job or anything. I was actually looking at product jobs and startup jobs in the Valley and I was going to move no matter what. Um, only a few days before I moved, actually, um, Mashable came to me and was like, we want to have you full time as an editor yeah. and offered me a job. And I'm like, we'll see how this goes. And here I am now. Yeah, so at the time, I mean, what in terms of where it is today, what, what percentage would you put out? Was it 1% of the amount of traffic that you get today? Was it 10%? I mean, how much has it grown in that space? I, I'd say it's grown more than tenfold at least uh -huh. since I've joined. It, it's grown exponentially. It's been amazing. I mean, it was well less than 10 people when I joined. Now we are 60 plus yeah. and growing. And what do you think? I mean, what what is what was the catalyst to getting – you know, for Mashable to be, you know, this blog that Peter Cashmore is running or writing on to, I mean, was there one, was there a single event that like, hey, you know what, this is, this is something real, this is actually, this could be, you know, was there, was there one event that kind of started to, to get it on that path towards I think today? I believed it was real at the very beginning. Um, I, I'm trying, I, I mean, I, it, it's just, a, it's a steady stream when you like, um, we threw our first Mashable Awards over in Las Vegas and mm -hmm. having like um, – I remember wa walking like through the audience and like, huh, chameleonaires here. Chameleonaires here. Huh, hey, what's up? Um, and getting more and more inbound, getting um, – I remember getting one a call like three minutes is like, um, do you want to interview Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore in five minutes? I'm like, okay. No. It was like 7 p.m. Uh, yes, of course I did. They, uh, it was a very lovely conversation. They're lovely people. Have you ever met them in person? I have not met Ashton Kutcher. Um, you know, I, I haven't. So it's definitely on my, you know, you have your four things. I have like three and that's one of them. <laughs> um, just go to a Y Combinator, uh, <laughs> demo day. He's demo. always there. So what? Uh, so le was was Mashable always this social media site? I mean, it felt feels like to me like one of the big things that that really helped Mashable was that it, it got on the suggested user list very very early, and um, and and they had all this great content, but like that to me was like this big stamp of hey, this is some. I mean, it was one of the very first. I I could be wrong here, but it's one of the very first new sites I recognized that was on that list, and it seemed like it kind of grew exponentially. 
you know, after uh, that. The suggested user list was um, an interesting time. Um, yeah, it definitely helped us get more visibility, but um, I think at the same time we had a very, very strong social strategy from the very beginning creating. Um, we don't just create new, uh, we don't just write news, we also create uh, evergreen content that, um, useful content, tips on how to better use social tools, uh, tips how to get the most out of different products, um, tips for entrepreneurs, tips for development. Um, we believe in, in giving our readers more than just the news. We want to give our readers um, uh, different insights, different advice, um, different ways they can really utilize uh, the digital world. Um, and a lot of our readers are, are marketers or, or digital influencers. And we want to give them like the tools and the power to um, create change. Can you confirm that uh, Peter Cashmore's beard is actually real? Is that real hair, or is that a spray? On I it? have never, I have never felt Pete Cashmore's beard on purpose to find out whether or not it was real. Um, I will make the assumption that yes, it is real. Okay. Um, he uh, so Mashable has gone. So it's gone through this this kind of evolution, right? It, it was this tech blog. It was it's well, it still is, but. I mean, it was very f focused on tech to begin with, and now it's kind of evolved. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, we these... recently launched a redesign of Mashable, um, and it includes a, a new top navigation. We have new channels. We have, uh, we have social media. We have technology. We have business. We have entertainment. Uh, and we have U.S. news and world. And you'll see more um, content for all those different channels as we um, expand. I mean, the goal is to be... Uh, a source of information for the digital world. How is digital changing all these different industries? How is digital impacting your lives? How can you better utilize digital? And I mean, I, so uh, who in the room reads Mashable? Can you raise your hand? It's fine if you don't. We'll just take you out later. We'll deal with you. <laughs> if you really want to feel good about yourself, how, how many of you read VentureBeat? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. That's That was more than I thought. Um, so... I, See, there's been some criticism, right? So, like, uh, I mean, Jolie O'Dell had this, you know, pretty wide, widely read, you know, review of her leaving Mashable and some of her thoughts around that. And and I think there's, I think that's that's been something that I've heard quite a bit is that, you know, Mashable seems to have, for better or for worse, it's it's kind of gone into the space of we talk about, we talk about everything, right? We talk kind of like. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what a good example would be. Maybe Half Post or something. Where it's like it's very, very broad. Um, have you guys, uh, have you, have you experienced that? I mean, what is, what is your take? Are you, do you deeply believe that this has been a, a very, very positive thing for the blog? Do you miss how it was before being more focused? Do you, uh, what, what, you, what is your thought? Our, our goal number one is to provide value for our, our readers, and um, our, our readers are interested and have always expressed interest in beyond just. Um, hard technology or social media. There's um, there's a lot to be said about what what is the impact of digital on the entertainment world. What is um, the impact of digital on politics? And I think, like for example, in the next year, I think we're going to see a huge emphasis on that as the campaign rolls out. Uh, there's I I, I think that um, I I love that Mashable can reaches so many people and can has so many different and unique voices and that we have such a diverse reader base we have a very diverse reader base worldwide um it's more mainstream it's it's not focused on silicon valley it's not focused on insider baseball we don't do insider baseball we focus on um the news that our readers find interesting we focus on um, tips and information and content that will help them better utilize digital and we will continue expanding as we look to grow further what uh, can you, uh, so it seems like especially recently in the last couple of months that blogging has like especially tech blogging it's it's been all over the news right and it feels like it, it, like blogging to me used to be like this this thing that it was just this nice thing it was like fencing for sports you know it's like you know white gloves I never heard occasional. blogging compared to fencing yeah well you've never been to the start of crime before I do it all the time. Um, Someone give me a sword. I'm kind of scared now. So, so like, it was this gentleman's sport, right? It was like, hey, I'll write about my stuff. You write about your stuff. High fives. And now it's like, it's like MMA right now. I mean, I, it, it, it's like you've got, you know, Venture Beat yelling at TechCrunch. You've got TechCrunch yelling at All Things D. You've got Mashable just doing their thing, not worrying about anybody else. I mean, what, what, 
what is your take? How is how is blogging in the tech world evolving, and is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Um, just like any other, I I, I think all these different publications have have a place and have a different role and they've all made contributions TechCrunch, crunch read all of them uh, make great contributions to, especially like to the um entrepreneurship world and to the technology world in general um and mash will we make a different contribution to it i think having different voices is is a great thing uh yes it can be entertaining to watch some of the uh little squabbles but uh, I think I think in the end, bo- I think those are just most distractions. I think the best stuff is really um, people breaking stories, people um, writing really insightful information, people um, really analyzing maybe what Facebook did, people analyzing what Apple is going to do, um, people us keeping these companies on their toes because um, we we have the ability and we have the responsibility to talk about what kind of impact will Facebook have on privacy, what kind of impact will um, the patent wars have on the industry and those are very important issues that we need to focus on what uh where do you put the line where 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 is the editorial integrity line with with you specifically where what like i mean mashable for a while was was you know rumored to be in talks with uh, AOL to be acquired this was maybe a year year and a half ago or two years ago uh, let's say that happened. Uh, wh- where does Mashable does Mashable draw the TechCrunch line? Where where is where's the Ben Parr line on uh you know if you had been acquired by AOL if you'd been acquired by Google would you write a very critical story about Google on that blog? The Ben Parr line can be found somewhere near the equator. I think somewhere near um uh, in the south end of Mexico. It's like the Bermuda Triangle. You'd write it in Spanish. Uh, I wrote it in an ancient language that nobody knows. It's called Klingon. <laughs> Uh, to answer your question for real, uh, I, 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 I mean, editorial integrity sport. And I, I, I don't think I think just for us, it's um, we're not out to pick fights. So that's not what we do. That's not what we've ever done. Yeah. We focus on what our readers really want. They don't want insider baseball. They want real content. They don't want drama. And so, really, the editorial line is plain and simple. Um, what's do our readers want, and what's best for our readers? And I think if you, if more, if publications um, follow that line, then um, good things generally result. It's the same thing. Like um, you trust in your users; your users are right. But these, but these stories get insane amounts of page views, right? I mean, like Michael Arrington's first. Uh, I, I I think a story about Facebook's big changes makes a lot more page views than um, a story about uh, a, a technology figure that's only known in the technology industry. Facebook is known by billions of people. Um, Michael Arrington is known by millions. There's a big difference. Yeah, I mean, I agree. At the same time, the interesting thing about this, and, and this, I think it's appropriate that we have you at this time, is that th- this this whole experience is one of the few things that my non-tech friends are actually interested in. You know, like, you know, I'll get the, hey, what did you think about the new Facebook redesign? Or, you know, my mom will be like, man, have you seen these Groupon deals? You know, you'll get it. And then it's like, you get the random, you know, my grandma is asking me about what's did you see about this Mike Arrington what he did this last week it's like how do you know about this stuff and i think like that's that's how big this has become and that's in and, and and i think it's like it's it's built and it's not just TechCrunch. it's it's all things d and and it's and then last night you know venture beats trying to get into the mix and so i think it's great that you guys don't and if you you know the the question is is they're doing it for a reason i would think not just to be drama i think it's they're doing it because it produces amazing page views and uh, or not. I, I, Maybe I, just I, mean, really... I, I, I don't know what their page views are on that. Maybe it is. Um, their audiences are different. It wouldn't generate page views for us. Um, and I mean, while it's sure some people are going to notice that and some people have noticed that, I think it's a fleeting thing compared to um, the bigger technology stories of the day. So we focus on we focus on that. We focus on what Apple's doing, what HP's doing, what um, you all, the great startups that you're all building. Um, I think that I mean that's a bigger focus. I mean that's just me personally. Like, um, yes, it's fun to look at drama and go like, <laughs> um, but uh, I I think it diverts the focus. I really do. What other other than yourself? Uh, name name two or three important or influential bloggers or journalists that you uh, that you follow that you that you think do good work. I can't name myself. Damn it. Uh. Kara Swisher comes to mind of all things, D, and I have a fun, I have fundamental respect for her, um, for ability to grab stories, for ability to um, 
analyze for ability to say what it is. Um, I think a lot of times uh, journalists can be too polite to say in, in terms of they don't ask the tough questions enough times. Some people. Um, and Kara asks the tough questions, and she asks the tough questions of entrepreneurs. She'll ask the tough questions of execs. She'll ask the tough questions of herself and her own staff. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm um, in love with my own team, but um, I'm not going to name any individual because they're all great. But that's well, they all really. They're are all watching. Great. I'm sure they are. They really are all great. Um, I'm thinking. I mean, there, there, there's just there's a couple um, shining spotlights in different organizations. Um, I think it's just I, – I, I think really what you see in the end is just uh, great content gets rewarded with um, – you get a lot of readers. You get a lot of uh, – you get a lot of readers. You get a lot of followers. You get that kind of thing. Um, you, you'll see stories broken by Nick Bielton in the New York Times or MG Siegel or TechCrunch. Um, and I think it's best um, – you, you get some very smart and very interesting contributions from – uh, those heavy people, people who are willing to, uh, who are willing to ask tough questions. So here's one of my toughest questions: Should we really? This is about Facebook. We're going to talk about Th this. You, one of the leading tech pundits on Facebook, I would say, very I, knowledgeable. By the way, very random. Oh, actually, you finished. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, please. My, very random. Wasn't the first question supposed to be asked by a woman? You said on Twitter. What was oh, that yeah. about? Cat, you want to ask? Oh no, no, it wasn't cat. Is Tina here? Dang it, Tina. I have sorry. We'll, we'll keep going. I was curious about that. I'm yeah. Like, what, what you put on form did you do you remember what you put on form spring? It, uh, it came from that. You said it said what question do you oh, want people that to ask question. You? Yes. Oh, I thought it was saying. Um I wrote on a I wrote a someone asked me in form spring um what I wish what everybody would say to me. And I think I said, uh, I wish everyone would say, will you marry – or was it? Yeah, what question would you Every, wish will people Will you marry me and you? then I would have my pick of the litter? Yeah, you, you, know, I th yeah, you said you wanted somebody to ask you every single day. If you had one person ask you every single day, then you would. You'd have a lot of choices. Um, yes. And was, I, we was, were going we to we we do that. We were going to do that, but my plant is not here. Aww. So I think what we should do probably is at the end when we actually take questions, we should probably – Allow if anyone wants to, male or female, I suppose. Um, We're equal opportunity here. You know, no judgments. So, uh, um, so you know, feel free to ask Ben, and I would imagine it will well it won't help with coverage because you guys aren't swayed by those kinds of things, right? Uh, yeah, we're not. We're yeah, not. No, although, no. although my my heart will be warm and fuzzy, and then I'll yeah. be confused and scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us. Uh, so back on this back on this line of people want to hear about Facebook, they want to hear about Apple, they want to hear about HP. Do we really need to know what fa what Mark Zuckerberg is eating or what he isn't eating? Do you feel like this is a this is something that people yearn to know? Like this this again this this falls in the stream of like of it gets great page views. Like Mark Zuckerberg killed a bison. That's like a great like man. I gotta click on that. Like I have to. <laughs> I have to know. Did he really like seriously in Palo Alto in the city limits? Like kill a bison? I don't even, like that's definitely not legal. You can't. Even I don't kill, know. I don't know if he you did can't even cut down a tree, you know, uh, without like permission from 100 people. So, like that, you know, there are these other stories about their updates and things like that. So I would, I leave it to you. Do we need to know what Zuckerberg is eating for dinner? Is this a story <laughs> worth reporting? Uh, you can be honest. You know, no judgments. Like I said a minute ago. I, 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 I think it's not about really that. That It's an interesting, fun title I had to go with it. Um, it's more the they, – they care about Zuckerberg. They care about this – he is a celebrity figure now. Yep. He, he is this titan figure, and people are interested in what makes him tick. And I think the story is not he killed a bison. Really, the story is he is uh, doing this personal spiritual thing um, to only eat what um, – he kills himself, and he's doing it for, um, for with good intentions. Like, not not to to understand like what he has taken and taken and is taking in. Um, I think that's interesting in terms of understanding who Mark Zuckerberg is as a person. And I think we all, a lot of us, care who Mark Zuckerberg is as a person. He's someone that a lot of us look up to. He's someone that we can learn from. Uh, and he's and he makes a good bison there. burger. Well, I, I don't know that. I've never tried one of his bison burgers. You should. Have you? It's a new hot product. It's a product extension they're going to do at Facebook. 
Zuckerberg's bison burgers. Zuckerberg. Someone should make someone should make a Facebook Copy fan editor page right for here. That. Hire him, guys. Hire this guy. That that's a Facebook fan page waiting to be made. <laughs> I'll wait while someone goes and types it that up. It will be done account. by the end of this meeting, I'm sure. Um, what 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 are your thoughts on the new on the new profile design? Have you are you is it as big a deal as people are saying? Do you think it is fundamentally changing things? What what are your what are your thoughts on it's it? It's a big deal in terms of uh, it, it changes how how we live our lives on the internet because it is now it is not just a stream of updates it is now an archive of everything you've ever done on the internet. Imagine looking at a timeline twenty years from now and seeing the things you did um, when you were twenty. The photos who you poked. Uh, I, do they keep that data? They do. Oh good. They most certainly do. And how much you play I've, Farmville? I I. I tr- but I'm like legitimately concerned I'm, about I'm, that, I'm, that I'm, particular here, stat. Here's what I'm interested in. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what in someone from my generation when that one of us uh, eventually becomes president of the United States. What uh, historians are going to do when they're looking back through it all? They're going to have so much information, which is um, which I actually think is a good thing because that gives us a much more complete picture of these great figures. Just imagine if you could look and figure out like. Um, what kind of life events made Steve Jobs? Like the and like these little details really do matter. Um, may, yeah, maybe we really don't need to know that um, he ate bison burger on Tuesday, March fifth. But we do want to. But it gives us a general ten. If you've ever, I don't know if any of you. How, how many of you have activated the new timeline profiles? Um, how many of you have not even seen them really yet? So, like, when when you look at this thing, like, instead of uh, just like a profile, how many of you know that Michael Arrington left TechCrunch? Oh, <laughs> do yourself a favor and look at the new profiles, because there there that is a completely different way of understanding your friends. Because you you go down and you can see who they friended, what kind of what kind of things they did, the kind of status updates they made. It is this progression, and you can get lost in one of your in one of your friends' timelines for hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think really Facebook wants to be this historical archive. When I saw it, they have a map feature where you want to um, where where it maps everything you've checked in. Now I want to check in all the time. Like Foursquare check-ins don't count towards Facebook check-ins. Now I really wish it did because right now I want to port all yeah, my Foursquare cool. check-ins into it because I want to complete that map. Yeah. I want to be able to say like here are the places that I traveled. Um, over years, I want to be able to look and be like, oh, I remember when I went there, and then click on maybe that trip I went um, to Croatia or that trip I went to Japan, and click on that, and I can get all the pictures that I um, I took there, all the tags that happened there, the status updates. Imagine that kind of power. Yeah, it's it it, it creates like um, a real like scrapbook. It is a database of our lives. Yeah, it's interesting too. I mean, they've that they've kept all this data for better or for worse, but it. It now some of it like that. That piece is really cool, right? To to know all those different places you've checked in or you've been, that's a that's a really cool piece of data. I mean, uh, to know who you friended and when. I mean, it, there could be some really interesting things about that, and and uh, who knows what else they have in there that they haven't released yet. But but uh, at the moment, I mean, those those seem seem pretty cool. What uh, what in terms of uh, mobile startups and in mobile right now? What what apps are you using the most? What is ex- what excites you about mobile at the moment? What apps am I using the most? I need to pull up my iPhone and check that. Wait, just curious. Who's an iPhone user? Raise your hand. Dear God. Android. Windows phone? Blackberry. One. Where's Dude. the Blackberry guy? Blackberry? Oh, we have two. Some other phone. Woo! What Bubble you... West! That's the copy editor. Do not you, hire you... that guy. I'm telling you. You will regret it. That That's like using... That's like dinosaur <clears throat> bones. It's like a fossil. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm excited that in terms of the mobile space, there's a lot of very uh, just very interesting applications. People are really starting to figure out like what you really can do with a phone, um, being able to um, see the world through photos, being able to soon pay with your phone. That just is going to happen um, more and more. Being able to um, exchange contact information through phones, being able to turn it into your personal gaming device. Um, there's a lot of cool things that phones can do. Phones are going to really replace 
mo the majority of the time we spend in front of laptops, we're going to be living in a mobile world where we're going to be able to do most of our work through these devices. And there's a lot more coming. There's and you there's a lot of different interfaces. It's not going to be a touchscreen forever. It's going to be much more advanced NUI interfaces, interfaces where um, we can interact on the fly. Uh, there's a lot that still can be done. I also am excited that there's um, I think I think there's there, there there's more competition coming. Um, I'm an iPhone user. I love my iPhone. The iPhone the iOS is frankly the best user interface out of all mobile phones right now. Um, but I, I, I've seen like I, I have Windows Phone as well, and actually I think Windows Phone is actually a very very good interface. I think Android's getting there. Um, a a Android is very open and allows you to customize a lot, and I think there's uh, more and more coming. Why didn't you say anything nice about WebOS? I I don't know I don't know much about the dinosaurs. <laughs> Um, what about uh, speaking of Apple? What do you think in ten years from now? You know, you know, Steve Jobs was the CEO in two thousand eleven. In two thousand twenty one, do you think we'll still be clamoring for Apple products? Do you think we'll still be lining up at the stores? I have no clue about that one. Um, the the only the only truth I can the only truth I can say about that is that all empires rise and fall. There is no exception. There has never been an exception in our history. There will be a time when the sun sets on the Apple Empire. I don't know if that's ten years from now or a hundred years from now. Um, but right now, Apple is right where it needs to be, and has dom is not only dominating the smartphone market but the tablet market. Is making big inroads in the in the laptop market and is going to ob j definitely jump into future markets in the near future. Uh, I, I don't know where it'll be 10 years from now. It's very, very, very tough to stay on top like that for very, very long. Do we, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? You can, we have a Startup Grind app. You're welcome to submit questions through there, which I can see. But if, uh, since I didn't give the shout at the beginning, is there anyone here that has a question for Ben? Your question it? should come in the form of an interpretive dance. You or have been or, watching our videos. Or a sing-along. Is there a Will You Marry Me sing-along? I was thinking row, row, row your boat. Yeah, go ahead, and I'll probably repeat it so we can get on the video. So what is your, if you had to break down your user base, especially looking at people from startup, from the startup users, out to the corporate market, and the people who are tracking or reading your content to have digital lightning track your content, how would you break up your reader base? So how would you break up Mashable's reader base? Um, I can't get into the specific numbers, uh, mostly because I don't have the reports in front of me right now. Um, but I, it's a very like beyond, especially for um, a technology uh, focused publication, it's very diverse. Um, it's both startup and corporate. You find a lot of um, I we there's a lot of marketers from a lot of big agencies, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of PR. There's a lot of startup founders that read us. There's a lot of technologists. There's a lot of developers. Um, we're on one of the publications, very few, where um, our gender ratio is almost even, and you don't find that in most uh, technology-focused publications. Um, I'm proud of our diverse, our very diverse uh, users and our very diverse reader base. Um, do you think that what's your name, by the way? Everyone say your name when you ask a question. I like Brandon. hearing. Hey, Brandon, what's up? Good. I like the hat. <laughs> Yeah, that's a little. What are you guys planning? Are you guys scheming something? Don't ask. Do yeah. see, the overthrow of the startup grind. They're perfect for the interpretive dance. <laughs> I, Let me ask the question again. Are you getting sucked? Do you ever feel the urge to get sucked back into being a glamorous founder? <laughs> uh, if you are, if you are in the business of glamour and you want to be a startup founder, you're in the wrong business. Uh, glamour doesn't come to very many startup founders, just as glamour doesn't come to very many actresses or actors. Uh, the answer, the truthful answer, is yes. Uh, uh, I love what I do. 
but I also love building things, and there will be a point when I go back and I go build things, and I work on things now. Um, I can't talk about them right now, but I'm working on I, I work on a couple different projects um, and play with cool ideas and work with some very, very smart and very amazing people. Um, and but I, I guess I, I, I think I always I'll always write in some way in some fashion. Um, and I think I'll always be involved in entrepreneurship in some fashion. Um, the ratio of which it is will change over time. Unless I like make a billion dollars, in which case I'm just going to live in a boat. <laughs> um, this question is from Bernie from our app. Where's Bernie? Is he here? Hey, Bernie. Hi, Bernie. Thanks, Bernie. Um, uh, what's your take on Amazon Fire as a platform that rivals Facebook and Google Plus? Amazon Fire doesn't really rival Facebook or Google Plus, in my opinion. Um, it re I mean, as an aggregator of content and audience. As an aggregator of content. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> Amazon. Jeff Bezos did his best impression of Steve Jobs, and he did a very good job. Uh, very good price point. Good platform. Um, not obviously not as strong. It's not as powerful as an iPad. But what do you expect with something that is less than half the price of an iPad? Um, but I think really you saw they really thought about the ecosystem. This is an Android device, but it doesn't really, really it doesn't run Android. It runs Amazon. The thing is Amazon. It's, a, it's an Amazon ecosystem. It just used part of the guts from Android to build it. And they're going to build out this Amazon ecosystem and this Amazon interface and all the future tablets and all the future stuff they do. Um, they be, that's true. They are really building a platform. Um, and they're trying to get. They're trying to be a media platform. They're not trying to be a social platform. They're trying to be a media platform. They want to be a, the primary consumption experience for your movies, your music, your TV shows, for all of that. Um, and they've done a good job so far. Um, but they're also competing against Apple and, in a way, Facebook with um, the Spotify and a lot of. You saw there's a lot of media in the Facebook in the Facebook event. A, a shocking amount of media. Um, I, I think there is kind of a battle for attention for that. Follow up. Yeah, I was gonna follow up. Have you read uh, Chris Espinosa's analysis of the Amazon Fire and how because they're porting everything out of the web, they're basically gonna uh, be able to intermediate Google. So oh, you're talking. So let's talk about that story. Yes, I did read it. Um, Amazon. One of the my favorite things about the one of the smartest things I think Amazon did with the Fire is their Silk browser. The browser um, is half on the tablet and half in the cloud. It ports all the difficult stuff, all the stuff that takes up um, all the processing power to the cloud and then sends it back, which makes for a faster browser. Um, but that also means there's a lot of data on Amazon servers. I don't know what they're going to do with that. Um, I'm going to definitely ask them about it. Um, but I definitely think that um, just like any other company, data is king. Data is always king. Data gives you more power. Data gives you more information and data gives you more power, more ability to make decisions, more ability to figure out what users want. Um, uh, are they going to be competing with Google in that way? I, I mean, I don't know. It could eventually happen. Uh, I certainly will never use um, – I, I can't imagine using a search engine from Amazon versus one from Google, but you never know. Uh, but they're, the thing is about these big technology companies, they're all competing in different areas in some way. I mean, uh, Google is – Google's competing with Amazon in terms of – um, the music players, but they're not competing in terms of um, e-commerce as much, but they might be more. And they ally in certain things, and they um, become enemies in certain things. Um, it's very, very complicated relationships between all these technology companies. Constantine. Yeah, is Facebook learning? Is is does Facebook know too much about us? Basically, what you're asking, right? Yeah, like I interrupt and you say, yes, you can invite friends, but you can tailgate. You know, I mean, <laughs> oh, we say that here too. Trust me, Constantine. I use that almost as much as I use the fencing analogy. Fate. Yeah. 
Well, your yeah. your freedom is to say I don't want to use Facebook and not sign up and can't. turn off your account. You can't. You're not on Facebook, and you're the vast minority. Um, Facebook is, is simply, frank, frankly, going with what it believes users want, and they predicted correctly over the years. Uh, the trend is and will continue to be people will share more um, because people are more comfortable with it. Privacy is going to be an outdated concept in the next couple of years as more and more of our lives focus around um, sharing what we're doing, making it easier to uh, communicate back and forth. Um, is it troubling? Yes, but it's I frankly think of it more as an adjustment period. In 15 years, 10 years, we're going to wonder why we shared so little and how could we have survived with sharing so little. I think that's the direction the world is going. Hi, Tiffany. Um, if you are, a Wait, can I repeat that? Yeah, go ahead. I've been screwing these up. So, what is your view on privacy and screening in regards to hiring? If I'm a, if I am a CEO, if I'm a company, oh, I'm going to screen you for everything I can find publicly on the web. Uh, that's just the smart and logical thing to do. I have a responsibility to hire the best people. Um, privacy, it's not. Um, none of none of that's off limits. This is the new era. Um, if you don't want something, if you don't want something to reach the web, you have two choices. You either don't post it, or probably better, you don't do it. Um, and that that's the new paradigm. We could clap for that. That was. Yeah. Come on, I'm serious. Okay. My my rule is I don't post anything that my wouldn't want my mother to see. But where the flip side is, I'm more and more comfortable with my mother and other people seeing more of what I do. And that's what's going to happen generally overall. Um, in terms of the jobs, job search, I think it's just fine. I think, frankly, um, that's employers need to um, figure out who they think the best candidates are. Um, and it shows uh, a lack of um, discipline if you are posting uh, pictures of yourself drunk in a tutu uh, at a bar somewhere. I've seen these pictures. They're scary. Who but are you looking at? I, I, there's no comment on that. Alex. <laughs> you iOS engineers. I'll, I'll repeat this one more time. I think privacy is an outdated concept. It is slowly, slowly seeping away. It will be something we don't think about as much in the future. Yeah. So what's your name? Done. Hey, what's up? How are you doing? I'm doing good. You? Excellent. Anyway. I am hot, yes. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> and this is one of our weirder events that we've ever had. Do you want to propose? or Because now would be the time. I, I'm going to stop you right now. No, continue. <laughs> No. Sadism, I can't post it to my friends because you know, my boss will judge me for that even though I'm the best coder out there. Don't. So the qu go, so you ask, repeat the question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, about that. Uh, so our so the question is, uh, will employers employers will judge us because we can't be who we really want to be online? Is that right? I, I don't Is that think, fair? I, I don't think that's the way. I think it's more don't be stupid. Um, you, the, the real truth is like if you want to be who you want to be, you probably want to work for a company where you can be where you wanna, who you want to be. I think that's the most important thing. Um, some employers aren't going to like maybe somebody who wears more tattoos and has more piercings but will fit in, in another culture and organization. Um, uh, I don't think you need, should hide who you are. Um, but I also think a lot of people um, settle for the job for a job or they uh, settle for a business partner or they settle for a relationship and because of that then they have to hide what they share because they don't share those same values um, yeah I say that as in a way where I know it's very tough to get a job right now 
Um, but that's that that's I guess the balance. If you're not in an organization where um, your values are the same as theirs, then yeah, you're gonna have to hide some stuff. That's just that's how it's always been though. The only difference is uh, now you have a lot more opportunities to share what you're doing. Yeah, I think I think too like what you said what you said a minute ago um, is totally right. It's like you've got to have you've got to have this perspective of more than like what I'm doing on Friday night. If you care about this, if you don't care, then do write post whatever you want. But yeah, if you have if if you care what your grandkids you know will see about you in 40 years, I think about that all the time. Like, do I want my grandkids to know that? I poked XYZ person at the moment. How old are you anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got a 12 year old, 12 year old grandchild. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried about them. They're on. What? (laughs) No. Yeah. Uh, so are, are you, are you, did you get, find the fountain of youth? Cause I would like some please. Or, or crazy pills. We have crazy pills at our startup. Um, no, but like you got to have that perspective, right? Of what, what, you know, be aware of what you're doing and, and writing and, what your presence everything, is online. Everything you say is recorded for future history. Spencer, how many more questions do we have? Okay, three more questions. Yeah, Startup Alliance. So, yeah, hey, I'm John Neff. What do you think of Google's real name policy? I understand why they did it. Uh, they, they didn't handle it right at all. They could have handled it much better. Frankly, I, I I think maybe it would have been nicer if they had the ability to put maybe your nickname in the middle or something like that. Um, I think there's a balance between um, their position and the position of pseudonyms. Um, I mean, Twitter is the place for having whatever pseudonym you want. Um, Facebook is the place for full real names. Uh, Google, I mean, their goal is to build this real name intra- information graph, a social graph, to compete with Facebook. That's why they do the real name policy. Um, I think really that is just that they could handle it better. Um, I understand why they do the policy, though. Yep. I'm Tom. Um, how do you look at uh, uh, semantic versus human created news? Uh, what's your view on paywalls? How do you look at semantic versus human created news? And what's your view on what? Paywalls. Um, so let me quickly hit paywalls. Uh, there are good paywalls and there are bad paywalls. Um, Wall Street Journal paywall is not terribly useful to anybody you get stopped it's um i remember reading this comparison there's the comparison of um the buckingham palace versus um one of those little tiny fences in front of the garden where it says please don't step on the grass um a f- so a lot more people can enjoy the grass and a lot more people um maybe they're willing to pay to get in a few people might step over the line but not that many the buckingham palace some people like a giant fence wall no one goes in everyone's like i give up i'm not i don't care um, I, I consider the Buckingham Palace to be um, Wall Street Journal's uh, paywall, and I consider the New York Times paywall to be more that, like, you can step on the grass. Um, the truth of the matter is that news organizations have to find ways to make money, and I understand why they put them up. Um, but um, if you don't implement them in the right way, then your traffic drops and um, a lot p- less people read your content. Um, and more important, like, big stories, like, the stories where reporters risk their lives to get the scoop um, uh, behind a paywall that can't be shared. Um, and the New York Times paywall, those stories um, will be allowed to be shared. And you can read the first 15 stories or so for free in a given month. I think that is a flexible model, and, and you almost feel compelled, like, I feel like I should pay. And I think and the numbers show so far that um, they've done decently well. I'm curious to see what the numbers go in the future. There's going to be a lot of tweaking to find the right one. Um, in terms of, he, uh, what do you mean exactly by semantic? Um, uh, like generated content? Yeah, machine generated. Machine generated content. Uh, it's getting more. I, I've seen. I mean, there, there's. It's shocking, like how some of these uh, programs can create maybe a sports story for a little league in that. Uh, there's, there's a machine. There's a out. There's a little bot that can take basic data from a little league game and turn it into a basic story with um, which reasonably well simulates a, a person writing the article with the key information. Um, h- human the, the, the thing is machines um, cannot make the judgment calls, cannot make opinion, do not have that capability. They do not have reasoning. Um, we might have a different conversation when um, there's artificial intelligence um, and 
machines can reason, but until then, um, human content needs to remain king, and uh, you need that analysis. You need that uh, ability to dig down deeper into the numbers, into the information, and find the truth. And a machine cannot do that, and a human can. Okay, last question. You, you get it. the last question. You get like a. Does he get a candy bar or something? Uh, you get a high five. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you see lobbying and uh, as a, in regards to privacy and other things going with web companies specifically? Uh, so what's always happened in the past, it's either big companies or a large coalition of small companies. They create an alliance or they create a group or they create a pack or they create something um, because individually they're not strong enough, but collectively they may be. Um, is that necessary for the Valley? Uh, frankly, probably would get better policies for the Valley if they had more representation. I, I understand why Facebook, for example, created their own uh, PAC this week. They created their own uh, uh, PAC to uh, go lobby in, f in favor of social networking and sort of policies that help social networking. Yeah, government's not a fun game. Government, God. yeah, they're playing. I was, I was they're playing poly the game, right? Uh, it's, I mean. it's 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 to you, yeah. It's you have to play in order to um, get what you want. That's just how it is. Um, and I think you don't have to play, but you're better off if you find a way to play. I, it's not necessary, I don't think, right now for startups. But there there are certain issues where um, if they banded together, maybe like startup visas comes right to mind. A uh, stronger organization to band together. You can clap. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's applaud him for that. Alex. Freaking Apple employees. I mean, it, uh, I mean, too, like another example is uh, Yelp's CEO, uh, Jeremy, going to Google and – or going to uh, – in front of Congress and talking about how Google has screwed them over. I mean, that's – what a way to fight competition, right? I mean, you, you go before Congress and try to get them to react and get them to do something to, to help them out. I mean, it's – it's playing the game. Yeah, pol right? politics. Yeah, politics really is a game, and they got they got asked to go up by the uh, Justice Department to, um, like, to testify and to talk about that about um, the Google stuff. Uh, I, I don't know what else really to say about government beyond, man, is it inefficient? I wish it could be run like a startup. Let's give Ben a round of applause. Um,